day we uh, had a conference here in Atlanta at the Westminster Presbyterian Church on children and family ministry. And there were some 150 people from all over the South, Southeast there, and some from Massachusetts, New York, Texas, and one family from Seattle, Washington. Ten people from St. Paul's was there. I think we had the largest representation at the conference. And I want to thank the ten people who came, people who are very much involved in our children and family ministries here at the church. Pray for them that they'll be able to assimilate, uh, that we will be able to assimilate all that was learned yesterday uh, to take our ministry to children and youth forward. A second thing uh, to update you on, we had a, a monthly joint meeting with our elders and deacons last Monday night. We're in the process of taking our mission statement of bringing the good news of the, of the kingdom of God to a diverse city and developing a structure that will help us uh, accent all the areas that our elders and the support of the deacons believe we ought to be focusing on here at St. Paul's. They're in the process now of putting together the oversight teams or committees that will look at the various aspects of St. Paul's ministry. So if you are approached by the elder deacon team to be involved at a certain point, I, I would encourage you to pray that God might put it on your heart to come and help us so that then we can move to the third phase and that's every member getting involved and doing its part in carrying out the mission. So please pray for our elders and deacons as, as we seek to develop the strategy for St. Paul's to make a difference in the Atlanta area. We're not just a building on the corner of Ponce and Piedmont. We are a symbol of the kingdom of God in this great diverse city. And we want that to be positive uh, in ministry to the city of Atlanta. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the second chapter of First Peter. <clears throat> if you don't have your Bibles, most of the verses that I read are printed in the bulletin, so you can follow me there. I want to begin reading uh, back in the first chapter with verse 24 and read through the 10 verses that are in the scripture in the bulletin with uh, a couple uh, following that. The Bible is the word of God. It's our only infallible rule of faith and practice. Let us give our attention to the reading of God's word. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and all envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that it may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, if you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and the stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they, do, they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, 
but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. May God bless this reading and our hearing and understanding of his word. You pray with me. Father, we ask you this morning, as you have inspired these words through your Holy Spirit from the pen of the Apostle Peter, we ask you, O Lord, to be our teacher and accept our worship this morning and open our minds and hearts to your truth. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak to you this morning on the topic, as, as the bulletin says, the great gospel, the great news of the gospel. As you've already heard, today is Reformation Sunday. And if you know a little bit about Reformation history, particularly of the 1500s, you know what that really means to us, especially who are Protestant Christians. I want to speak on verses 9 and 10 uh, of our passage this morning because I believe from a practical perspective, and I underscore the word practical, that this passage in 2 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, underscore what the Protestant Reformation was finally all about. It was, of course, a multifaceted movement back uh, then in the 1500s and the centuries that followed. But I, I and uh, as I thought about that, I, uh, being Reformation Sunday, I, I could have talked about the sovereignty of God because certainly that's what the Reformation was also about. I could have talked about the Holy Spirit who seemed to come back into the church at that particular time. But I believe what Peter writes about is spot on as far as what the Reformation was really aiming at uh, as God created that movement. What a great historic event. We've been underscoring in our messages in, in recent Sundays the importance of understanding God, the importance of understanding who we are, of what kingdom living really involves, and where salvation is fits into that overall scenario. The pragmatist, the pragmatist, of course, is a person who says, well, we don't really need to understand all of the stuff we've been talking about. It's after all, they might say, you don't need to know everything about a cow in order to enjoy all the dairy products that the cow is produced from the cow. Or, you don't need to understand everything there is to know about electricity to flip the switch and enjoy all the power that comes as a result. And while there is truth in both of those illustrations, it's not the whole truth. Let me ask it another way. How important do you think it is for, for us to have God's perspective, for us to have a right understanding of God, and a right understanding of His plan of salvation? Well, to answer that question, we have to look at the broader picture that God gives us. We have to learn about God and we learn about him specifically from the Scripture because the Scripture is his word to us about himself. It's God's word to us about not only who he is and who we are, but what we're to believe about him and how we're to live. And it's a revelation about those things. And that is the crux of what the Bible is all about. The revelation of the person and work of Christ at the heart of God's message to us. God wants us to understand enough about himself 
and about us and salvation for us to come to the point that we realize that salvation is not of ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. And he wants us to be perfectly clear about that. Because there are far too many people that believe they're trying to lift themselves up to heaven by their own bootstraps, as we might see, say. But he wants us to know when we call him our Lord and our Savior, what that really means. How do we know that he's our Lord and Savior? Because he's written about it in the Bible. And as we will see in this text, he wants us to understand at that. He wants us to be able to talk about our salvation in a biblical way to one another. But then we're also going to see that he wants us to be able to talk about salvation to those who are in the non-believing category. And we have to be prepared to do that because God says we have to be prepared pragmatist again says, well, you don't have to understand it. And we respond, yes, we do. It is our responsibility before Almighty God to understand what He wants us to understand. We can't cop out at that and honor Him. Now, I know there's some things in the Bible, and we're going to see this this morning, that as we try to understand what God shows us about himself, ourselves, and salvation, that seem contradictory. If not contradictory, at least a little bit contra controversial. And I'm not going to get up tight this morning by trying to put everything together in a tightly knit package. But I do want us to see what God says. Our text deals with a subject that many have, many have said, don't waste your time trying to understand it. It's too deep. It's too complicated. Don't try to understand it. I've, I've heard that in my ministry far too often from people saying, I can't understand it, so I'm not going to worry about it. But the problem with that kind of thinking is God has put it in His Word for us to read and understand. We can't cop out at that particular point. Most of the time it's because we're lazy and don't want to put the effort into doing that. But God has said do it. We need to understand the truth about God, ourselves, and salvation. I, and I say that not because when we stand before God, God's going to judge us on, on the basis of how much we know, as a professor might do grading in a classroom. What we're going to be judged on is whether or not we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And that we're trusting him for our salvation. That's what we're going to be judged on when we stand before him on judgment day. And though we need to understand all we possibly can about God and his will for our lives. We don't have to know everything perfectly in order to go to heaven. Paul says we see through a glass darkly. But then, when we're with the Lord, we'll understand fully, as we have been fully understood. But because God has written certain things to us in this book, it is our responsibility to read it, to believe it, to understand it, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, to allow it to impact our lives. You know, it's one thing to say that salvation is of the Lord. But it's another thing to understand what that really means and how that impacts our lives. It was the Protestant Reformation that God used in history to drive the truth home to us about our salvation. 
You see, prior to the 1500s, especially as we came through the period that was called the Dark Ages, people were not allowed, much less they couldn't in the first place, but if they could, they were not allowed to read the Bible. In order to think about God, they had to think on the basis of what a human priest told them about God. And only the priest could tell them about God. And only the priest could finally take the sacraments for them as a means of saving them from sin. Well, the verses that I read for you here this morning in 1 Peter 2 deal with the doctrine of election. Or it's, we could say it actually fits into the broader subject of predestination. It's a doctrine that many have called the heart of the gospel. It's one that's to our advantage to understand as far as God allows us because our Westminster Confession of Faith, which contains a summary of the doctrines that we believe are taught in Scripture, says to, to believe and understand the doctrine of election and the broader subject of predestination brings us great comfort. If that's true, you think our enemy wants us to have comfort? Of course not. So people just kind of try to gloss over that. But not only does understanding something of the doctrine of election and the broader predestination bless our souls, it mobilizes us to live for Christ every day. I guarantee you. What if this had been left out of God's story? What if He didn't tell us about election? Well, if it had been left out of God's story, so would we have been, because that's the only way we get in. God has to choose us. And as we look at this, again, I remind you, we can't understand everything that God knows about this because we're not God, but we can know everything that God tells us in the Bible if we will listen and learn. And as I've said before, you've heard me say before, I'm glad I don't know everything God knows. That's why I need to come and bow before Him. He's the Almighty God. We can only speak about God as God speaks to us about Himself in the Bible. We can only believe, truly believe, what God says to believe in the Bible. John Calvin, the second leader of the Protestant Reformation, along with Martin Luther, underscored that over and over in his preaching, teaching, and writing. If God speaks, we must listen. If God does not address a certain subject, we have to be quiet about that because we don't know the truth about that particular subject. So in this passage, Peter deals w with God's reality. And when we look at God's reality, there are two, two things that we have to see. On the one hand, we have to see God's divine sovereignty. God controlling all things that come to pass. On the other hand, we have to see our human responsibility. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. When we think about those two great biblical truths, we have to realize again that God knows exactly what He's doing. And what they remind us of is God's graciousness in sending His Son, the Lord Jesus, to redeem us from sin. And to remind us that he does that because God planned it 
Christ executed it, and the Holy Spirit applied it to our lives. And when God does that, he's not fickle. He won't love you today and not love you tomorrow. As a matter of fact, if you understand this, you can't make God love you at all. You can't make God love you any less than, than he loves you right now. Because that's the way God works, and that's the way God is. And the great doctrine of election that Peter writes about reminds us that God is in control. Our God is running the show. He's sitting on his throne working all things together for his children who love him and do his commands. And though there are times in our lives when we sin and God may allow that sin to, to run its course for a while. If we are among his elect, we will not live in sin without repentance. It's just that simple. I can't fully understand all of this, but I can't accept it because it's in the Word of God. And as I think about this, I've been challenged more and more, and especially in recent days, to be like that little baby. Desiring the sincere milk of the Word that I may grow thereby. Peter says in verse 2 of our text, that we who are elect, the elect of God must crave the spiritual milk of the Word. And he's not talking about con contaminated or spoiled milk. He's talking about the pure milk of the Word of God. We must hunger for it day and night. As I said, there's so many truths in these ten verses of our, the Scripture that I read today. I feel almost guilty jumping over them. But I do want us to, to pay particular attention this morning to verses 9 and 10. Because they're so foundational to our understanding what life is all about. Now, to understand some of the things Peter says, you have to go back in the first chapter and look at the first verse and see to whom he wrote the, this epistle. He wasn't particularly writing it to the Jews. He was writing it to the Asians, Gentile Christians. And when he says there was a time when you were not the people of God and when you did not have mercy, but now you are the people of God and you do have mercy, it was by his grace. And that's what he wanted them to see. It was as though Peter was saying to, the, to his audience, there was a time when you did whatever you wanted to do, whatever brought you pleasure. You didn't consider God and his will. Spiritual things were not important to you. The Bible, the church, the Christian life, prayer, these things were not even on your radar screen at one point in time. You had no interest in them at all. And growing out of that, you had no mercy at all. In fact, you were not even God's people at that point. But Peter says, now things are different. <laughs> you are the people of God. You have received mercy. I have shown compassion on you. I have loved you with great mercy. In chapter 1, verse 3, it re refers to the great God giving great mercy to these people. But now you have received mercy. It's come to you in your lostness. It's come to you in your sinfulness. And it's given you a sense of identity in God. God chose to redeem you out of the state of sin and death to bring you out from under his wrath and judgment and to make you to be his people. And not only has he done that, he's written your name in his family book. 
and he cares for us. Now in verse 9, Peter says that we were a chosen people. And he said we were chosen by God in a similar manner as Christ was chosen and honored by God in his resurrection, in his death and resurrection. And Peter says in a similar manner, we have been chosen by God. And basically what Peter is saying to us is God loved us. And he took the initiative to do whatever needed to be done to forgive our sins and to make us into his people. So do you get what Peter's saying? There was a point when you were not a people of God. You had not received mercy. But now by God's grace, you are a people of God and you have received mercy. And I hope that excites you when you hear about that and to think about that. If that doesn't excite you, let's just listen to how God describes the process. <laughs> In verse 10, he says, we are a chosen generation. Chosen means elected. God elected us to be saved. That's why I call this truth really the heart of Reformation theology. It's actually the heart of the church because it says that God has chosen us and we are His, not because of anything we have done, but by His mercy. If God had not chosen us, we would still not be a people of His own possession and we would not be in his name, Lamb's book of life. Now, there's mystery in this when we talk about this. I don't think, and I think C.S. Lewis would agree, agreed with this, the mystery is not so much why did God not choose everybody to be saved? That's not the mystery. The mystery is why he chose us. Why did God choose us to be saved and not others? We can only appreciate that if we are in Christ and we listen to God's Word. Now, why do you suppose there are those that don't like this truth of election? Do you think it's because they have to realize that some are chosen to be saved and some are not? Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe because it underscores that we didn't elect ourselves. <laughs> we didn't choose ourselves. God elected us. And God chose us. And that's really hard for a sinful human being to admit. But that's the way it is. You remember Jesus back in John 15 said, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Listen to how a couple of the great hymn writers express this in their Elizabethan English. Tis not that I did choose thee, for Lord, that could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, hast thou not chosen me. That's how one writer said it. Here's how another said it. I sought the Lord, and afterwards I knew that he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not that I found, O Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. T'was not so much that I took hold as thou, dear Lord, took hold on me. Beautiful words to remind us that we are chosen in Christ. Now, if that doesn't excite you and that doesn't give you a tingle in your minds and hearts to think about that, listen to the second descriptive phrase that Peter uses. He says, in, we're chosen in Christ to be a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. He wasn't talking to clergymen or preachers or rabbis when he said that. Every believer in Christ is called to be 
a royal priest in the family of God. That's what the Reformation was all about, the priesthood of all believers. Every believer in Christ has access to God. You don't come through a human mediator anymore. There's only one God and one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. And so the Reformation underscored that you didn't have to go to God through a priest. And if you remember or notice, that's why I told you I, when we do the Lord's Supper, I stand behind the table and the elders stand by the side. You don't have to come through us to get to this table. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. But unlike the pre other priests in the Bible, like the Levitical priesthood, we don't have to wear certain robes and jewelry. We don't have to come bringing the blood of sheep and goats and lambs in order to offer sacrifice to him. We have to be a royal priesthood. I have a friend who heads up a ministry called the Third Millennium. As a matter of fact, he was one of Phil Ellen and, and Ryan Heath's professors in seminary. Uh, on some occasions in his seminars, he would have the people to stand and greet one another with these words, Welcome, Your Majesty. Welcome, Your Majesty. I started to get hung to do that this morning. As you greeted one another to say, welcome your majesty. We are a royal priesthood. That's how Peter describes us here. And that's special. And we do have to bring sacrifices as a priest. But the sacrifices we bring is that of a lowly and contrite and obedient heart. Do you understand the implication of that? Do you really know what it means that we can come to Christ at any time, at any place, day or night, no matter where we are? We have access to God through Christ. We can go to Him any time with any problem because He cares for us. He brought us into His family. And that's the heart of what Christianity is all about. Quickly, the third description that Peter uses here, he refers to us as a holy nation. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. There have been a lot of nations that have come and gone since the creation of the world, but there's only been one nation referred to as holy, and that's the church. That's the royal priesthood. That's the elect of God. That's the people who have been redeemed by Christ to live for Him and to serve Him. We are a holy nation, and we live under the constitution of this Word. It lays out our path and our direction. When we hear this, we need to be reminded of two things on the divine sovereignty and human responsibility. We can't do anything to earn our salvation. All you can do is receive it by, through mercy. You can't be good enough to be saved on your own. Impossible. But on the other hand, you can't be saved if you're not good. Bad people are not going to heaven. Good people who have been made good by the grace of God and the righteousness of Christ are going to heaven. And we have to live that life right now. Why? Because to put the final touches on this, the fourth characteristic that Peter uses to describe us is that we are a people belonging to God. We're God's. You and I belong to God. First of all, by creation, He created us in His image and likeness. But when we sinned, He sent His Son Jesus to redeem us back from sin. So we belong to God doubly. 
by creation and by his redemption. We are God's people. We belong to him. And my friends, I want you to see the importance of Peter's description of us in this word. But I want you to see one last thing. Why did God save us? Why did he choose us to be among the elect? Certainly wasn't because we deserved it. Certainly was, we're not lovable. Uh, we didn't, couldn't do enough good works to earn. Why did he choose us? Peter tells us. It's very clear. The reason God chose us to be among his people is that we might show forth his praises to all the nations. You see, our salvation is not just about ourselves. It's about the body, the church. But it's also about that missionary charge that God gives us to show forth His praises to all nations. So you and I this morning, in order to benefit from this great priesthood of all believers doctrine, have to be committed to doing that. Now let me ask you, are you showing forth Jesus Christ in your life? Are you doing that at church? Oh, oh, but Charles, that's a given. <laughs> you know, well, do you know some of the some of the worst things that could happen have happened in the church? Broken relationships. Look back at verse one. Slander, deceit, lying. Hypocrisy, those are the social sins that can break down the unity within the body. And I've seen that in too many churches. We must show forth Jesus Christ in church. And we must show forth Jesus Christ in our families. Just this week, I, I talked with two different families, not from St. Paul's who asked me to pray for them because they were facing possible destruction. God hates divorce. He says so. He doesn't want families broken. He doesn't want churches broken. He doesn't want hurt relationships in his family. And what about at work? Can people see Jesus in you? If you're a Christian, you and I have the privilege and obligation to show forth His praises who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. He invites us to His table. And when we come to this table, as we will do in a few minutes, we come remembering Him, what He did for us in coming, in dying, in being raised, and promising to come again. But my friends, if you come to the Lord's table this morning and meet us here at His supper, I not only want you to remember Him, I want you to remember Peter's description of those who are invited to come, a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession that's committed to showing forth His praise in every facet of our lives. And if you come like that, you're going to find wonderful grace here because the Lord says so. He's here with us. And he wants us to come, but he only wants us to come remembering him and remembering who we are. Pray with me. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for choosing us to be yours. Thank you for writing our name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, our Father, for including us 
and the wonderful plan of salvation. Thank you for the hope of heaven that we have because of your grace and mercy. And Lord, I'm so thankful that I can be a part of your people. And I'm so thankful that the family of St. Paul's is part of your people. And I'm so thankful for the church universal from every tongue, nation, tribe, and people. May we be as one. And as we have the privilege now, Lord, to worship you in obedience and remembering and coming to the table, prepare our hearts. And Lord, may it motivate us not only to love you more and more, but draw us to serve you every day that we live. We ask it together in Jesus' name, amen.